Chapter 4, The Seeker After Truth. From Peru, I returned to Chile and continued working at the hospital. The successes my mentor and I experienced in the outpatient program, we called the program Healing Circles, must have improved my reputation among my colleagues somewhat. They started referring their more difficult cases to me. Here, one of my fellow psychiatrists said, handing a patient file to me, since I'm not having any luck helping this man, maybe you can do something with him. One day I found a patient file on my desk with a note staple to it. I don't think anyone can help this woman, but you're welcome to try. The number of patients referred to me quickly grew to the point where I could no longer find spare time to see them individually. I formed a private group that had many of the same features as the healing circles at the hospital. The successes continued there as well. One woman in the group had incredibly low self-esteem. She was intelligent, beautiful, and married to a successful businessman. Yet she often felt hopeless and even suicidal. During our work together, she discovered she was subconsciously comparing herself to and competing with her husband. Within weeks, she took on new responsibilities with a nonprofit organization and felt like she had taken control of her life again. Her fears that having her own life would threaten her marriage were unfounded. Her husband was proud and pleased with her new accomplishments, and their relationship became a greater source of joy than it had been in years. One man in the group was plagued by shame and guilt. He never felt happy or relaxed. During our sessions, we went over his past to find the source of his shame. Other than some poverty he suffered about the time he had met his devoted wife, there didn't seem to be any missed opportunity or cruel deed we could explore. In the middle of another participant's rather painful sharing, this man suddenly started crying. When we asked what had evoked the tears, he said he hadn't wanted the group to know his wife had been a prostitute. Although she was faithful to him during their 25-year marriage, he believed deep down that every person he met sensed his wife's past and judged him harshly for it. Through the support of the group and some relaxation techniques I taught him, his paranoid feelings and depressions started to disappear. Another woman in the group felt resentment boarding on rage toward her husband, who had no idea what he had done to upset her. And tracing back to the start of her hostile feelings, they apparently started about the time of her 28th birthday. Her husband had presented her with a grand piano after discovering in one of the rare talks he'd had with her estranged father that she had been an accomplished pianist as a child. The rage the woman felt toward her father, who had forced her to play the piano against her wishes, was evidently transferred to her husband years ago. In exploring and releasing her fear and anger toward her father, her marriage improved and she finally began playing the piano that had been covered up for years in her parlor. In fact, I heard she later gave concerts and recitals professionally. In one session, we discovered that two men, a sociologist and an architect, had brought firearms to our group. The sociologist, we found out, was a radical leftist, and the architect was a member of the extreme right faction in the months before the coup against Alain. As the two men discussed their childhoods and their families, they discovered the humanity beneath the ideologies. In a later session, both men broke down in tears, hugged each other, and cried out, I don't want to kill you. During this time, I received a reply from England in the form of a letter signed by Adira Shaw, the author of the two books I had been given. He told me I was accepted into his study group and gave me instructions for my next task. The following Thursday evening, I entered the home of the tall aristocratic man who gave me the books and card in the warehouse district months before. His name was Horst Beckman. He turned out to be the leader of the study group, which he called the Terika, Arabic for the path. Horst showed me into his dining room. Five other members of the Terika sat around a table, two women and three men, including my colleague, Dr. Perez. 
I attended meetings of the Tarika every Thursday evening. We met at Horst's home and read Sufi stories aloud to each other, mailing our reactions to those stories and others we were asked to read individually to England. Eventually, each of us was sent a new story to read and report on. This new story was different for each group member, depending on how each of us responded to the first story. After a few weeks of this, I grew a bit impatient with the teaching process. We were learning symbolic stories of three blind men and some grapes, for example, but I didn't see where it was leading. I voiced my frustrations to Horst after one of the Thursday meetings. Is this all we do in this group, I asked? Read a story, report on it, and read another story? There are meditation techniques we teach as well, Horst said. Perhaps if I teach you one of them now, it will help to address your intellectual frustrations. Because Sufism is based on a secret doctrine, a real appreciation of its traditions must come with the help of a teacher. You must live Sufism to truly understand it. But I have been studying Sufi traditions for some time, I said. Horst answered, Sufism is not like a building fixed and unchanging, left for future generations to learn from and study. It is more like a garden. It is active, changing, and grows with the input of others. A Sufi school is born like any other living being. In order to flourish and not disappear, and to prevent itself from becoming mechanically ritualistic, Sufism is transmitted and activated by humans. So be patient, Carlos. Take the essence of this esoteric knowledge and bring it, embody it, into your contemporary self. He ushered me to a couch in his living room and led me through the meditation he called a self-realization technique. The purpose, he continued, is to learn more about your life's purpose. Remember, Sufism is not really Eastern or Western. It is the balance between the two. There are two ways to acquire knowledge argument, and experience. Argument brings conclusions, but does not remove doubts. Sufism provides experience so that your inner life can be activated. This sounded more like what I needed, so I settled back on the couch and asked, what do I do first? Whenever you have the opportunity to learn something, Horst said, you must first repent. Repent what, I asked. You said you are unsure of the value of our study meetings here, correct, Horst said. Yes, I said tentatively. That is what you must repent, he said. You must repent your objections to this group study. Okay, I said. What if I agree to see this learning process through to the end, whatever that is? You must still repent your objections. Even when you've agreed to learn something new, there remain in you objections to that learning. Make a habit of repenting your objections first whenever you are offering a teaching. I nodded for him to continue and tried to relax and address my objections. Once you have repented, Horst went on, you must return to rightness. He glanced at his watch and then at me, saying, Don't worry, we should have time to finish this. I sighed and tried to relax more. Returning to rightness, Horse explained, means aligning yourself with your original intent, which was to learn. The next step is to renounce. You renounce all your little egos. Little egos? I wasn't sure what he meant. I won't bother with the Arabic word and the whole explanation, he told me. For now, think of them as all the little labels and ideas you have about who you are. Let's see, how would you describe yourself? I'm Chilean. My parents were Austrian. I'm a psychiatrist. I am tall. I have blue eyes. I enjoy going to parties. I do yoga and meditate every morning. All little egos, Horst interrupted. You must renounce any labels used to describe you. They only get in the way of learning. He paused for a few moments. So what do you sense is the end result of this meditation? I shifted in my seat and ventured... <laughs> I guess I need to submit to whatever the teaching asks me to do. Horst smiled. Be sure you do not become a slave of the teaching. When the teaching becomes greater than you, it is of no use to you. The surrender you practice in this technique teaches you trust, not submission. 
Fear and doubt take you away from your true self. Trust leads you to it and allows you to remain connected to your higher self and deepen your understanding of that part of yourself. The content of the stories you read is less important than your dedication to the process. When the members of our group finished their initial training in Sufism, our Thursday routine changed from solely reading and discussion to actual participation in Sufi ceremonies. Thursday night is sacred to the Sufi. It is when divinity and humanity come together. On these nights, members of our study group met at a Sufi shrine and entered a dimly lit room where a number of men gathered for the dervish ritual. As we did this, Horst, who embodied the leadership of the assembly, gave a signal to begin. Silently, 12 men formed two parallel lines in the center of the room. The glimmer of the lamp in the darkness made their eyes come to life. The spiritual exercise began with the sikhers, the repetition of one of God's sacred names. These names are also attributes of God. So by repeating the name, an individual brings the attribute alive in himself. Sikhers are used to anchor a virtue, such as mindfulness, harmony, devotion, self-discipline, and to build character. With a startling clap of the hands, Horst began swaying slowly from right to left. The men fell into the rhythm of his swaying. Every time they swayed to the left, they said, who, in chorus. This dancing motion is very powerful, bringing closer communion with God. Thursday nights were now in my consciousness added to the sacredness of Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays. At this point, half the week was already a sacred time, as well as every morning and every evening. Life was recovering its sacredness. A few months later, when I received the training scholarship in Gestalt therapy I had applied for at a Sealand Institute, I started making plans to complete my residency requirements there. I communicated my acceptance to Adira Shah, and he wrote me a very brief, mysterious note that said, don't forget that not everything that shines is golden. It took some time for me to understand what this meant in practice. A childhood friend of mine named Diego had also applied to a sailing and been accepted. Diego was three years older than me and had always been something of a hero to me growing up. I had modeled much of my early career after his success. I even dated his wife's sister for a time. He was now the chief resident in psychiatry at the hospital where he worked. And I looked forward to the opportunity to share this experience with him. A few months later, I was on a 17 hour flight north to California. After a couple of weeks in Berkeley, I traveled down the coast to Big Sur, where the Assailant Institute was starting to develop an impressive reputation for consciousness studies and for its hot tubs on the ocean cliffs. My friend Diego had already arrived by the time I got there. For the first time in my life, I saw a side of Diego I never witnessed before. He seemed somewhat nervous and was less sure of himself than I remembered. While we were going through the intensive training program in Gestalt therapy, we had the opportunity to mingle with some of the most impressive minds in the field of consciousness research, including Ram Das who had just returned from India, where he spent time with Nem Karoli Baba. John Lilly, the physician and scientist who had just returned from Chile, where he studied Arika training. The method of human awakening developed by Oscar Ishazo, and based on the Enneagram, and Gregory Bateson, author of The Steps to an Ecology of the Mind, former husband of the world-renowned anthropologist Margaret Mead, and pioneer in the field of family therapy, who was living in Assalan. Just being in their presence was an inspiration and an example of where human potential could reach. For the Gestalt training, we met in small groups and used a variety of techniques with other students as our clients. If a student was having trouble expressing anger, she was directed to place a pillow or cushion on the floor and beat on it with her fist to the point of exhaustion, and eventually the buried anger surfaced. Another technique for getting past personal defenses and exposing repressed emotions 
was to have a student sit in the center of a circle composed of the other participants who barraged him with the questions and observations from all sides. A big part of the training also involved role playing. One person played some part of another's personality so that she could have a dialogue with that part of herself. It was the early 70s, a time of great experimentation with various kinds of humanistic psychological techniques designed to free internal and external confusion. At Asalen, I became familiar with a new context for the ecstatic moments I experienced in South America. Abraham Maslow called them peak experiences, and the researchers at Asalen had begun cataloging dozens of triggers to these events beyond what I had experienced. The intense emotional inner work of the Gestalt training brought up great sorrow as well, since I started realizing how I had a representation of my father, my mother, and myself as a child within me that needed to be cared for and supported. After completing the training, Diego and I decided to stay at Asalen a while longer to take in some of the other classes they offered. At an evening meal near the end of a conference being held there, Diego and I were approached by a German artist and therapist named Klaus von Thuringen. Klaus reminded me of an ancient barbarian. He was hairy and heavily muscled and spoke in a deep, resounding bass voice. He told us he wasn't planning to stay for the end of the conference and asked if we were interested in accompanying him back to his Sonoma County farm for what he billed as the most complete lesson in surrender possible. Diego was a bit dubious, but we figured we had nothing to lose and agreed to give it a try. Ego surrender is indeed too mild a term for what Mr. Von Thurgen had in mind for us. For three weeks, as we went to sleep nightly in his barn, surrounded by cows and goats, and only a thin layer of straw between our bodies and the cold ground, Diego and I referred to our daily training with our host as ego annihilation. For example, in the middle of one of our exercises, Klaus's young daughter came up to us and showed us what looked like a spider bite. The redness around the bite suggested the spider had been venomous. He asked us as medical doctors what would we do in the situation. I described how I would try to find the spider, rush her to a hospital, and hope they had the proper antidote to the poison. Instead, Klaus viciously insulted us put his mouth over the wound, sucked out some blood while his daughter stood there unflinching, took a leaf and crumpled it in his hand with some juice from the tobacco he had been chewing, applied the leaf mixture to the wound, and told us there would be no sign of the wound the next morning. And there wasn't. The next day, Klaus explained that he had learned this technique from the Sioux Indians. White men had tried to study the chemical elements that compose the tobacco, the saliva, and the juice but had forgotten to add to their chemical and pharmaceutical products the human vibration, the essence that was really the healing element. Until those in the West realized this, said Klaus, bugs, viruses, and bacteria will become resistant to technological stopgap measures by using their own life force to take in the chemical compounds and adapt them as nutrients. It's my vibration and the intention behind it that when mixed with all the physical chemical elements healed the wound. Intention and personal power are more potent than any man-made chemical. It was the depth of Klaus's knowledge on subjects such as this that fascinated us and convinced us to follow him during these exercises. On one occasion, while we knelt on the ground with our shirts off, Klaus threw guacamole dip in our faces and told us we were worthless. Anger and dismay mingled inside of me, and internally I seriously questioned these surrender techniques. On another occasion, Klaus handed me something to eat. I swallowed it, and he told me to monitor my feelings. I felt fine for several minutes, but eventually I developed a severe stomach ache. When I reported this to Klaus, he told me I had ingested strychnine, a poison I knew could kill me. I looked at him, ready to accuse him of being a madman, but in his eyes was a compassion and caring that helped me believe he wasn't really as sadistic as his teaching methods might make him seem. He taught me how to breathe and meditate to overcome the effects of the strychnine. 
and I had no more ill effects from it. One night, Diego and I were sitting on the ground in a rigid lotus position when Klaus told us we could choose if we wanted to be ridiculed in front of his art students the next morning. I said I would try it. Diego was more hesitant. Klaus told us to close our eyes and maintain our sitting position until he came for us early the next morning. At one point, he came back and placed an antique Persian gold coin on my thigh and a large rock on Diego's lap. Klaus didn't come for us in the morning, though. We never saw him again. Several hours later, as the sun started rising in the sky, Diego removed the large rock from his lap and collapsed on his back. Carlos, he moaned, I would like to go home. This may be our only chance to escape. I started laughing, and Diego joined me in this release of the previous day's tension. So Diego left his boulder there, and I took my gold coin back to civilization. Diego got on a plane to Chile, and I headed for a friend's house in Berkeley, where I was to stay for my last several months in California. A week later, I was back on a farm, but this time I was with my friend Jeffrey and his friend Patty. And the farm was a very pleasant, comfortable Buddhist retreat center. Patty was a devout Baptist turned Buddhist, and she had convinced Jeffrey and me to go with her to see this really cool lama who was leading a weekend retreat on mental health. With a subject like that and a recommendation like that, I joked with her, how could I say no? The really cool lama turned out to be Lama Tharteng Toku Rinpoche. He was a roundish Tibetan monk with short hair, dressed in the traditional burgundy robes of his station. Everyone at the retreat could feel the energy he projected, and we were all drawn to him. He shared with us several techniques and meditations from his Nyingma tradition of Buddhism. The first technique he taught us involved each of us approaching the front of the room one at a time. There he asked us individually, what is your problem? When the student explained a personal challenge he or she was facing, Thartane Tolku usually broke out in a fit of giggles. He said he found Westerners' problems amusing in their insignificance. When he settled down enough to be serious again, he set a wooden box in front of the student and said, I want you to imagine placing your problem in the box. Now jump over the box. Where is your problem now? The student, of course, said the problem was now behind him. Thartane Tolku replied, Good. Do you see it? When a student answered in the negative, the Lama said, Trust me, the problem is behind you. Leave it there. Lama Tharteng Toku also taught us that meditation is self-healing. He said, Many diseases are the result of blockages in our physical bodies caused by our emotions. In Tibet, there are very few cases of cancer because the environment is tranquil and life is less stressful. How can meditation cure these diseases, asked one student. He said, meditation is a process of deep understanding of our mind and our nature. A calm mind is like a still pond. We can see our problems like waves and our self-image like a reflection. A beginning meditator needs to still the mind and retrain it to be the observer. A more advanced meditator can learn to relax, let go, and just be, without effort and without attachment. It is then we discover the mind itself does not exist. This natural state is the state of self-healing. Visualization, the natural attention of seeing, produces light and a flow of positive energy to those areas which are harmed or diseased. I understand that stress can cause blockages and thus disease, but all organisms must die, said another student. Yes, this is true, said Tharteng Toku, but we must therefore learn about transcendence so that we can find our inner peace. Modern technology has given us a lot of comfort, but our needs and habits trap us. Therefore, it is very important that we go beyond it. In a meditation of impermanence, the Lama told us, 
visualize a yellow light entering your circulatory system. Now focus your attention on the individual red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. After a couple minutes, he continued, because the blood is fluid and constantly in motion, it is difficult to focus on a single element of it. In the same way, you should concentrate on the whole of life, not on the circumstances of individual beings, yourself, and those around you. My favorite meditation, however, was the one he called inner massage. The object of the exercise was to make sure the flow of life force was not becoming blocked anywhere within ourselves. In it, he asked us to relax our bodies and minds so the edges would be softer. Then we were to imagine fingers massaging our bodies and minds from both the inside and the outside. The Lama Thartang Toku was able to express some of his teachings of the ancient Tibetan tradition in terms compatible with my Western understanding. The teaching of re-identification or detachment was one of the most important things that I learned from him. I asked him once, how does one know the job one needs to do? He replied, it doesn't matter what job you do. The important thing is the attention you give it. It's like the sun, which always gives light and never gives darkness. Always be aware, alert, and attentive. These actions are of the utmost importance because they do not accumulate darkness or emotion, habits or suffering. Alertness is like the lotus. It has its roots in the mud, but its flower is always pure. To develop, you need to know how to meditate, and then you need to transcend your meditation, and then you need to know how to renounce meditation. I should stop doing my spiritual exercises, I asked, puzzled. No, he answered. I mean renounce all conceptual ideas of meditation and be alert and attentive. I began to see a connection between all the spiritual teachers I had learned from thus far. Attention was the great metaphysical tool used to keep oneself in balance. A few weeks later, I was walking up one of the rather steep streets of San Francisco when I saw an older man with bright blue eyes leaning against a car. As I was looking at him, the man asked me, can I give you a ride somewhere in a slight French accent? When I nodded, he unlocked the car doors and I got in. Where are you going? My driver asked. I have a meeting up the street near Van Ness Avenue, I replied. I meant, where are you going in life? I'm studying the soul's power to heal. I'm a psychiatrist. Who is your teacher, the man asked, sounding more interested. I am studying Sufism with Idris Shah, I replied. And what path do you follow? Is there more than one path, I said, waxing philosophical. There are many paths up the mountain, he said, but they all converge at the summit. There lies the key to the golden path. I thought back to what Don Eduardo told me. The man parked the car. This is where I have my appointment. He scribbled an address on a piece of paper and handed it to me. I'm giving a talk this weekend. If you're interested, be at this address at one o'clock Sunday afternoon. I thanked the man for the ride, and he shuffled into a nearby hotel. That Sunday afternoon, I showed up at the address he had given me, a house in Oakland, not far from the apartment where I was staying. The house was filled primarily with women in their 40s and 50s. One of the women asked me who invited me. I spotted the old man who had given me the three-block ride sitting in the next room and pointed to him. The woman seemed very impressed that I had such an influential friend. Someone told me his name was Alan Node, but that meant nothing to me at the time. As he talked about beingness, I envisioned a golden globe hanging in the air before me. In it was a large golden key, the same key I had seen during my initiation with Don Eduardo. The key entered my sternum, turned, and opened my chest as if it were the gates to a beautiful palace. 
The feelings of inner awareness, love, and satisfaction that washed over me were remarkable. In the midst of the deep emotions and gratitude I felt, I approached this man after his talk and asked him if I would see him again. It probably isn't necessary, he replied. You have already received the essence of the teachings. When I returned to Jeffrey's apartment, Patty was there visiting. They asked me where I'd been all day because they'd been waiting to take me to a movie in Berkeley. When I had said I had gone to hear some man named Alan No to speak, Patty felt slighted. You had a meeting with Krishnamurti's closest disciple, and you didn't tell me, she complained? Where did you get all these invitations? I'm not exactly sure, I answered. I really don't go searching for these invitations or meetings. They just seem to happen to me ever since I surrendered to the flow of life and to my own essence. Each encounter I have leads me to the next step as long as I don't try to direct or control the situation. I have come to believe there's a message that the ancient mystics knew, and I feel I'm completely guided to find this mystery. As long as I listen to this guidance, I'll continue on this path. If that is true, I guess I need to start listening more attentively, Patty said with a smile.